Lady and gentlemen, might I offer you a warm Scottish welcome to this new entry in my best and worst of Soulsborne series, the fourth entry in fact, following on from my videos on bosses, levels and regular old enemies. If you're wondering whether I might already be starting to run out of ideas for elements from these games to assess in the series, the answer is yes. <laughs> Seriously though, it is getting tough. But hell, people seem to like these videos and the comments have been universally positive across the board, unanimously. And so I say why not squeeze out another delicious brown egg of content into your mouths. And indeed, the topic of today's video is mini bosses. But what exactly is a mini boss? Well, to be honest, I'd say the answer to that is slightly subjective and even differs somewhat from game to game, but a serviceable starting definition is a particularly powerful enemy which does not respawn after defeat and which doesn't play out like a regular boss fight with a big boss health bar and fog wall. Now, as you'll soon hear, some of the games have way more candidates that meet this criteria than others, which made it a bit tricky to make some of my choices, but as always, I followed my heart and I picked my picks. I will say the same here as I did in my best and worst enemy video though. When it comes to my picks for worst mini bosses, I'm not simply going for the lamest ones, but rather the ones I least like to see or fight. The ones that make me piss my pants with irritation, frustration and... uh excruciation. If you like the video, hey, why not subscribe to the channel? I make fun videos about great games. And let me also give a massive thanks to my brilliant patrons for supporting the channel. Now let's get stuck right into the first game on the list, Demons's Souls's. Folks, of all seven games on this list, the mini-boss pickings were at their absolute slimmest with Demon's Souls. You get your big boss at the end of each level, and for the most part, that's it. However, thankfully there were a few suitable candidates for the role, for the position. To be honest, none of them are that great, so not the best start to the video, I'm sorry. But I have chosen the Vanguard Demon. Not the one from the tutorial, because that's still a straight up boss fight, even if you are expected to die, but rather the optional one found in the first level of the Shrine of Storms. If you're anything like me, you got utterly annihilated by the tutorial vanguard within just 5 seconds of passing through the fog wall, and just like that your chances of nailing it here are up in smoke, unless you've got the inclination to create a new game file and take it on again in the tutorial. But just a bit into level 4-1, past the rolling, striking and sniping skeletons, there's another vanguard demon just kind of randomly standing over there at the other end of this open area. I guess this was primarily done to give players another chance at taking it down if they blew their load in the first 5 seconds before like I did, because otherwise you'd forever miss out on getting its grey demon soul which can be used to make the dozer axe over a blacksmith head. The actual fight plays out exactly like the tutorial boss, that being that it has just 4 possible attacks, decent reach and it can do a surprising amount of damage. It's easy to get a bit cocky when you first see this thing here because inevitably you'll be a good deal more levelled up than you were before and with better gear too. But even so, and for as basic and limited as the demon's moveset is, it's very easy to get nailed by it a second time, especially when you have the nearby storm beasts intermittently firing magic projectiles at you from above. One strategy you can employ is to just stand back a bit and pummel it with ranged attacks and watch its grotesquely long nipples ripple with each blast of magic or strike of an arrow. It'll never stray that far from its position here, meaning that this is essentially just free damage, it's free real estate. Though you can always just try and bait out that gravity defying hover attack, the one that still appears in FromSoft's games in some form even today. Like I said, none of the choices from Demon Souls were that great, but the Vanguard is just fine, and I actually really do like how unceremoniously it's situated in this level. Sometimes it's nice to have a load of fanfare and cutscenes prior to a difficult enemy, whereas other times the encounter can be made more memorable by just having it there and letting its mere presence do all the talking. As for my pick for worst Demon Souls mini boss, I actually came dangerously close to picking one of the two dragon demons which appear all throughout Boletaria. Yes, they look damn incredible and are key components to several stunning, scorching set pieces throughout that world, and they substantially mechanically enhance the levels they appear in. The Lord's Path, for example, is actually one of my all-time favourite Soulsborne levels. 
but the issue arises if you choose to fight the damn things, because it requires a strong bloody bow, a quiver full of powerful bloody arrows, and a spare 10 to 15 bloody minutes of mind-numbingly tedious waiting and firing and waiting and firing, and it sucks, especially for the blue dragon in 1-4, which is over 4.5 times the HP of its red counterpart. But for as downright boring and unengaging as the dragons may be to fight, no. I cannot justify insulting them like this. They add too much to the levels they appear in. No, my pick is Old King Doran. Believe it or not, I actually considered picking Old King Doran as best mini boss, but then I remembered that for as badass a character as he is, and the fact that he's a fellow Scotsman, might I add. I am the Old King. Show me thy strength and the power of thy souls. I don't actually like this fight at all. In fact, I think it's shit. FromSoft's games have certainly had their fair share of highly challenging human-type enemies who move and attack in much the same way as you yourself can, which itself is a large part of what makes them so challenging in the first place. But you know what else can be done to turn an enemy into a monumental, pun intended, ball ache to defeat? Why, just give them an absurd amount of health, sky-high defence, insane damage output and hey, why not make it so that he can just fucking heal back up to full health right when you start thinking you might actually have a chance. Old King Doran is an opponent I want to love. I really like the idea of this literal demigod residing in this old mausoleum, waiting to be challenged by some new warrior of legendary power beyond human imagination, but in practice, it's the opposite of what a good NPC fight should be. He's not difficult because of any sort of interesting moveset, he's difficult because his stats are way higher than they should be, which is not my idea of an enjoyable challenge. In fact, most of the recommended strategies to beat him involve some AI or positioning exploit. It is with no great relish that I betray my fellow countrymen, but Old King Doran? Ha! <laughs> you should probably um, rename him to Old King Boran. Wouldn't that be funny? Okay, so this one was a little bit awkward for me, because we've got a wee bit of overlap here. In my previous video, where I talked about best and worst enemies, I named the Black Knights as my favourite, and they do indeed function like regular respawning enemies when you encounter them in the Count of the First Flame, but everywhere else you fight them, they are effectively mini-bosses which do not respawn. And as such, I've got to give it to them again here. They really are the best enemies in the game. But, for as much as I'd love to simply copy and paste the same chunk of script from my last video, I'll instead focus on the runner-up, that being the Berenique Knight. Now, in truth, of the just three Berenique Knights there are in the game, only the one found in the Undead Parish can really be considered a mini-boss, whereas the one on top of Sen's Fortress and in the Painted World both respawn. But, even so, I have always absolutely loved these enemies, especially the one in the Undead Parish. An aspect of Dark Souls 1's early game that I've always found to be very effectively done is the enemy variety. Sure, you start off fighting your emaciated, maddened hollows, but then you quickly graduate to your undead soldiers, wielding various weaponry and even sporting pieces of armour, clinging to their corpse-like forms. But then after that, the game rapidly starts throwing ever more menacing and intimidating armoured enemies at you, ones that make you stop dead in your tracks the second they come into view and think, oh god, I'm gonna die now, aren't I? The aforementioned Black Knights absolutely have this effect, especially those first two you see in the Undead Burg and Undead Parish, and certainly the Balder Knights as well, especially those three you see hanging around in that church. But behind this trio stands a different sort of knight, a Berenique Knight. I was petrified the first time I clapped eyes on this dude. Everything about him is massive and heavy and utterly imposing, designed to give you great pause before daring to approach that shiny item behind him on the altar, though other than their size, nothing about their appearance is actually unique. They wear the steel set, also worn and sold by the crestfallen merchant, and they wield a tower shield and either a mace or greatsword depending on which variant you're facing. Except, everything's been scaled up in size, to the point where you're effectively fighting a dark iron monster, one that shakes the very ground with their attacks, though surprisingly they can actually be parried if you've got the stones for it. 
Despite their intimidating size, Berenique Knights really aren't particularly difficult to beat, but I truly do get excited whenever I see one, I get aroused, because they're both really rare and enjoyable as hell to contend with. Sure, Dark Souls has some more exotic mini bosses I could have chosen, ones that are much larger and more monstrous, stuff like the Hydra from Darkfruit Basin or Ash Lake, the Mass of Souls down in Lower New Londo, or the Undead Dragon from the Valley of the Drakes, or the Painted World, but for as big and awesome as enemies like that look, they're really not great to fight. In fact, I love everything about Ash Lake's Black Hydra, except actually fighting the damn thing. And all I have to say about the Undead Dragon is... But none of those enemies are my pick for worst Dark Souls mini-boss either. In fact, my choice might even surprise some folk, because I don't know that it's an enemy that people traditionally hate fighting, though maybe there's more vitriol for it than I realise. I'm talking about the Titanite Demons. Awesome design for an enemy, and that first encounter with one feels similarly intimidating to the encounter with the Berenique Knights I was just talking about. In fact, the two enemies are only about a 30 second run away from each other, but it takes more than a nice set of pecs and a fucking missing head to get me impressed, because I truly hate fighting these things. If you go in for a ranged strategy, then it really ain't too bad. A bit boring maybe, but essentially you just have to take cover from its lightning projectiles and then briefly pop out to send forth a couple of arrows or a bit of magic. But if you're primarily a melee focused player like myself, then good grief. These titanic titanite titans can be borderline baffling to handle. For me, the trouble lies in their hitboxes. It's like some of the hitboxes linger for that bit longer than they really should after the actual attack animation has played out, often making it seem like you should by rights have avoided damage only for you to still get hit anyway, sometimes multiple times with the one attack somehow. And it also doesn't help that they have crazy range, being capable of leaping way farther than you might think. As you might expect, the Demon Pit in Sense Fortress is a nightmare for me. In fact, it's one of those sections I tend to avoid at all costs on any playthrough, though mistakes can happen. That respawning one in Lost Isolith is also really difficult to manage due to how narrow the path is, because this is an enemy where you want plenty of room to manoeuvre. Which brings us onto perhaps the single worst room in the whole of Dark Souls 1. Yes, that room in Anor Londo. Who the f thought it was a good fucking idea to put this prick in this wee room? See how it pounces? Did you see that goddamn hitbox? Now, in retrospect, after watching this footage back, I'll admit I wasn't doing myself many favours here by fat rolling all over the place. Oh, I guess I'm the bad guy now, right? But even so, just a very messy enemy to fight, and ultimately intimidating for the wrong reasons. Whereas Demon Souls had very few mini bosses to choose from, Dark Souls 1 had a pretty damn decent selection, but now we're talking Dark Souls 2, which is back to having very few, though fear not. From here on, the games are far greater mini boss variety. I could have taken Dark Souls 2's phantoms into account, I guess, both the base game NPC based ones and those which only appear on New Game Plus, but that would have been kinda lame, because none of those enemies are really all that interesting or even unique, but heck. Screw all them anyway, because there's one particular enemy, one cursed being that stands far above them all. It is the Pursuer. Of course, the Pursuer appears as a conventional boss in the Forest of Fallen Giants, with its defeat being required to move on through to the Lost Bastille, unless you choose to get there via the Tower of Flame and then No Man's Wharf. But even before that, you can encounter him as a mini-boss of sorts not too far from the Cardinal Tower Bonfire, where he makes a hell of an entrance, dropping down from above after clinging to a three-legged bird. This encounter is pretty unique in that it's literally a one-time fight, because if you die here, the Pursuer will never return to this spot for the remainder of the playthrough. But never mind that, because it's the times after where the Pursuer most functions like a mini-boss, at various points throughout the Lost Bastille, in the Smelter Demon Arena, and, perhaps most notably, in the Throne Room of Drang Lake Castle on New Game Plus, where two appear at once, always rising up out of the ground in a dense haze of dark smoke, and sometimes already in a buffed up state where the curse is literally leaking out of their armour in foul fumes, with this tying into a core part of the Pursuer's backstory. Story. The item description for its weapon reads, The Pursuer hunts down those branded by the curse, as if each undead soul that he claims will atone one of his own sins. 
You can even see these undead souls represented as screaming faces on the front of its very armour, with the arsenal of weapons carried around on its back, clearly having been claimed from its countless victims as trophies, though the only weapon the Pursuer himself ever uses, regardless of where you fight him, is its Ultra Greatsword, which itself has the ability to curse the player if you get hit by that glowing, charged and pale attack. Honestly, one of the sickest enemies in Dark Souls 2. The Pursuer has a brilliant, detailed visual design, is extremely fun to fight with a surprisingly wide variety of attacks, including some rare ones, and he's unique in the way he appears throughout the game, pushing the idea that these dark entities aren't merely situated in specific locations, but rather they are pursuing you, hence the term Pursuer, that's where we get the term. I know that they don't actually pursue you, there's nothing dynamic or unscripted about their appearances, but still, awesome enemy anyway. As for the worst mini boss, well if this had been vanilla Dark Souls 2 we were talking about then I might have been left scratching my head here trying to think of something, but then we got the score of the first sin, and with it, countless changes to item and enemy placements, and certainly some changes to enemy density, Iron Keep. But one pretty striking, fairly early game addition was made to my number one favourite Dark Souls 2 level. I'm talking about the freaking dragon they placed near the entrance to the old Dragon Slayer boss arena in Hyde's Tower of Flame. This dragon can suck my don't get me wrong though. See these enemies in general? They're great. In fact, you fight a bunch of them over at the Dragon Eerie and I really enjoy all those encounters, and you also fight a more buffed up boss version of it in the form of the Dragon Guardian at the end of Aldeus Keep, but the reason those encounters work is that those dragons are placed logically and fairly throughout those levels. This dragon, however, is not placed logically or fairly, but rather, it's like FromSoft thought, wouldn't it be really cool if we just put a dragon here? To which everyone on the team said, yes. Hi. And that was about as far as they actually thought about it, because as a melee player it can be a complete nightmare, even trying to get to it, never mind beat it, and you have to beat it in order to get to the old Dragon Slayer boss by the way. It'll often just spam its fire breath attack, meaning you literally can't run up here and get to it without taking damage, and even getting stun locked to death possibly, and if you think you're safe from its fire breath down here, you know behind this thick stone barrier, nope, the fire just goes right through it. I know I'm probably getting a bit too hysterical and whiny about this one dragon, because you can always use a decent bow and take it down from range, sure, or even just use some poison arrows, but as a more melee oriented player, this thing feels awful to fight. Not difficult, not interesting and challenging, awful. Especially if you made the mistake of defeating the Dragon Rider first and now every Hyde Knight in the level is also converging on your location. You know, on second thoughts, maybe Hyde's Tower of Flame isn't my favourite Dark Souls 2 level. Ugh, I'm just choking, Hyde's Tower of Flame, I fucking love you so much. Ah, Dark Souls 3. Oi, oi, oi. Damn, yes. do you understand what's gonna happen? I love Dark Souls 3 to bits, I want to kiss it on the lips. And what's more is that it has mini bosses galore, glorious mini bosses galore, featuring all manner of blazing demons and cursed abominations, though my absolute favourite among them is the one stomping around on the broken bridge leading to Lothric, the stray demon. Funnily enough, we already discussed a very distant cousin of the stray demon earlier in terms of animations and general design, that being the vanguard demon, but I much prefer this iteration. We also saw somewhat more direct likenesses of the stray demon back in Dark Souls 1, with its asylum demon, demon fire sage and of course very own stray demon, but that was back in a time where the fires of demon kind still burned strongly, back in an age where the first fire had been linked but once by Gwen. In Dark Souls 3 however, the fire has been linked countless times, growing weaker each time, while the world around it stagnates, becoming more warped and dismal, and even the demons are almost all gone. Indeed, there are precious few of them in Dark Souls 3, and the ones you do find are either isolated or lost, though they all make for brilliant and sometimes even emotional encounters. For me though, this stray demon, still acting as the gatekeeper to a now useless gate, is the most emotional. Over time its skin which should be black and leathery has taken on the appearance and texture of rock, 
it has completely lost the ability to make use of fire, as evidenced by its use of the boulder heave pyromancy, with cold rock being all it can muster from its core in its old age, in this old age, and the sounds it emits, while being intimidating and monstrous, are also tortured and lonely, especially if you decide to target its legs, leading to them quite literally crumbling away to nothing while the body fights on. Might sound silly, but I sometimes even get a wee bit emotional watching and listening to this enemy, but then Dark Souls 3 is just like that. It's by far the most depressive of FromSoft's games, but in a strangely beautiful way. As for worst mini boss, well the quality of Dark Souls 3's mini bosses is generally pretty damn high, which made this tough for me to make a choice. I was going to pick the Karthus Lightning one because in my opinion it could not possibly be less interesting or fun to fight, but at the same time it adds a lot to the smouldering lake visually. I'm sure everyone remembers that first time they began venturing over to the distant fog wall while desperately trying to time their dodges to avoid the bolts from the massive crossbow, only to be greeted by the sight of the single largest entity in the game, and one with the ability to use lightning no less. The Karthus Worm is really boring to actually fight, but just as with Boletaria's dragons, I'm glad it's here because it looks awesome. My actual pick goes to an enemy I, in truth, also think is really cool, but which I just hate fighting, in kind of a similar way to the Royal Revenants from Elden Ring. It is the Outrider Knights. I don't even dislike this enemy overall, but Jesus, they can fuck me up in a way that no other enemy in the game can. I actually consider Dark Souls 3 to be perhaps FromSoft's single most finely tuned game difficulty wise, especially when it comes to the bosses. It's a tough game for sure, but it's fair. I pretty much never feel miserable and oppressed when playing it the way Sekiro and Elden Ring have the power to make me feel, but heavens to Betsy. The Outrider Knights are on a different level of difficulty. They move in the same bestial way as Vort of the Boreal Valley, except way faster and more frenzied, and with even more frost buildup. Whenever I'm fighting them, I always feel like I'm on the defensive, and on my last playthrough in particular I remember getting absolutely tilted by the one in Lothric Castle. I just could not stop dying to it, and I got so mad. Even so, let me be clear, I don't think Outrider Knights are a bad enemy, they're just unusually frustrating to fight in a game that by and large is not that frustrating, and in the same vein I also have to give a shout out to another monstrosity from Erythil, that being Sylvan's Beast, who also sucks to fight while still being a really sick enemy. Ah, Bloodborne. They call me Bloodborne Boy in my hometown, and for good reason, I love this game. As far as mini bosses go though, for the most part you've only really got your hunters, the ones scattered around Yarnum and beyond, many of which are really difficult and frankly not fun to fight. There is however one big, hairy exception though, that being my pick for best Bloodborne mini boss, the Abhorrent Beast. Of course, at first it's merely the suspicious beggar, though calling him suspicious is something of an understatement, considering he's standing over the dead body of a woman with his arms heavily stained with blood up to the elbow. Hmm. Nonetheless, he seems like a friendly chap. So why not send him on to Odin Chapel, a safe haven, hosting several other survivors of this particularly nightmarish night of the hunt. But what's this? One of the survivors has been killed stone dead, but he was such a nice man too. Not really, he was actually a bit of a dickhead, but still. Hmm, and look who's nearby. You know, I think this guy's a bit too suspicious for my liking. Yes, the true form of the suspicious beggar is the abhorrent beast, and the only one that appears in the base game too. You can fight it as a boss in the Chalice Dungeon though, and in fact I consider the abhorrent beast to be the single greatest Chalice Dungeon boss, please watch my video on the subject. But here it's just intended to be a terrifying surprise encounter unlike any other in this story. It can be a very tough fight too because you won't know any of its attacks due to it being the only one of its kind in Yarnum, and it only becomes more dangerous in phase 2 when its lightning gets intensified. The most noteworthy aspect of this encounter though is the fact that it somehow still retains the ability to think and speak rationally even whilst in beast form, even going so far as to launch scathing and thought provoking accusations of brutality and beasthood at you, the hunter. Easily missable encounter too, in fact I didn't even see this guy here until my third playthrough and if you simply never attack him, he'll never attack you. 
though he will gradually pick off the inhabitants of the chapel if you let him loose in the place, even your sweet, sweet grandma. For worst Bloodborne mini boss, there really isn't another monster or beast type enemy to choose from, but if you're taking all those hunter fights into account, those horrible, horrendous hunter fights, then there is one in particular that really stands out as being an utter ordeal, and that's really saying something when you've got the likes of that trio of hunters in Yahargul. Christ, those guys stink. But my pick does not go to them, but instead to the bloody crew of Canehurst. Thankfully, very easy to completely avoid this enemy in the first place, especially if you're not the kind who tends to bother with NPC questlines. But if you're intent on finishing Eileen's questline, and who could blame you, she's a great character, then it all culminates in a decisive battle with the Canehurst crew within the Grand Cathedral, whilst Eileen herself lies battered and bloodied at its doors. I actually feel very similarly about this fight as I do to Old Man Dorin from Demon Souls. Both are NPC type enemies, they're both extremely tanky, they can both heal up, and they both have massive damage output. The Canehurst Crow here can also fire off very quick and powerful shots from his repeating pistol, and let's not forget that this is Bloodborne, where the action is particularly fast paced. There's truly not another enemy in the game where I feel in as much danger as I do when I'm close to this guy. And that includes the bosses, because almost no boss attack is as fast as the slash from a Chicago. Meaning this fight is as much, if not more, about smart spacing than sheer reaction time. It just feels too cheap though. You can die so damn easily, like I did here, after performing reasonably well for 5 straight minutes before getting sniped right at the end. Tragic. It's such a difficult fight that one of the most common recommended strategies is to lure the crow towards the cathedral entrance and then hit him with poison knives as he's returning back to his designated position. Though, when I returned back here later with the Holy Moonlight Sword, I did have a surprisingly easy time of it with some well-placed thrust attacks. You know what though, for as borderline unfair a fight as it is, it's all worth it to close out Eileen's story and to hear her last words before she departs from the hunt. grow heavy. Let me rest a while. I'll be fine. Just wait. Finally, we come to the undisputed king, or should I say shogun, of many bosses the game with the biggest and best selection of incredible optional enemies. Well, most of them are incredible. There's a whole bunch I really like for different reasons, but right from when I started making my selections for each game, I already knew who the award would go to as far as Sekiro was concerned, and that is Seven Ashen Spears. Oh god. Shikibu Toshikatsu Yamauchi. Let me tell you, my very first playthrough of Sekiro was a brutal one indeed. Good lord, did I struggle and suffer at nearly every bloody juncture, and certainly when it came to the bosses, obviously, but the many bosses gave me even more trouble. I still keenly remember the frustration I experienced on enemies like General Tenzin in the Ashina outskirts, Snake Eyes Shirafuji, and any of the Shishim... Shichimin warriors. But god, this first seven Ashina Spears warrior standing at the top of these steps in front of the Moonview Tower, I could not believe how difficult he was. I just couldn't beat him. His attacks did way too much damage, he had too much damn health, and his animations were just difficult as hell for me to read. I couldn't comprehend how the game could be this hard. This was on another level of difficulty compared to any of the Souls games or even Bloodborne. But then I came back later once I had a bit more health, more healing good uses, the Makiri counter skill, and a damage upgrade or two, and I also decided to actually use my wits and make use of some stealth this time to cut his HP in half with a rear death blow, and things clicked right into place then. In fact, they clicked into place so much that I came to absolutely adore this fight. His attacks are extravagant and terrifying, but that just makes it feel extra satisfying when you pull off Deflex and Makiri counters, and this enemy's placement here is also really well done. This is of course the tutorial level 
from earlier where Wolf was at his weakest, but I love the way FromSoft repopulated it with harder enemies upon your return, upping the threat level substantially with this particularly formidable opponent. For the worst, well I mentioned the Shichimin warriors before, who do indeed kinda suck to fight because they make use of terror, which is an incredibly annoying status effect, way worse than Bloodborne's Frenzy, and you also need a fairly scarce consumable called Divine Confetti to actually deal decent damage to them, and as such, I really don't find these fights to be very fun. They're gimmicky, but in a rather tiresome way, but I'll tell you which mini boss I dislike even more, and that's the one that's probably on the tip of everyone's tongues right now, the Headless. The Headless have the exact same two terror gimmicks I just mentioned, except everything is way harder and more obnoxious. For a start, their arenas are pervaded by a thick ghostly fog which heavily restricts your mobility, meaning that your only viable option for avoiding damage is well-timed deflections. The issue with this is that regardless of how well you time those deflections, you are looking at substantial terror buildup with every damn hit. Sure, you could use pacifying agents or even the purple mottled gourd if you have it, but all the while your divine confetti is running out, and you've already had to heal up a few times, and you've barely dealt any actual damage so far, and oh look, it stuck its hand up my arse. Both the Headless and the Shichimin Warriors are far more easily taken on with the Phoenix's Lilac Umbrella, which does fully cancel out terror buildup, but you're unlikely to get your hands on that until a good bit later in the game, and even with it, God, I just don't really like fighting these things. The encounters are very intense and deadly, yes, but not in a fun way, and the less said about the underwater pair in Fountainhead Palace, the better. Thankfully though, every headless in the game is completely optional, which is a good thing too because they're an enemy I almost never go out of my way to fight. Right, now for me Elden Ring is where the mini boss criteria thing gets a wee bit complicated, because depending on what way you look at it, this game either has an insane number of mini bosses or very few at all. Sure, there are a whole bunch of completely optional enemies you find at the end of dungeons and in ever jails and even out in the field, but the issue is those big bothersome boss health bars, which for me means they are bosses, not mini bosses. However, there are still some excellent options to choose from. I was super close to picking the Draconic Tree Sentinel standing guard just outside the entrance to the Beast Clergyman boss arena, because for as brutally difficult as this guy can be, and for as many times as I've been well and truly flattened by his Dragon Great Claw, especially when he has his red lightning buff on the go, I personally find the Draconic Tree Sentinel to be one of the sickest and most enjoyable enemies in the whole game. Period. Except not quite because there's a different kind of knight who is just that bit more deserving, the Crucible Knight. There are a whole bunch of Crucible Knights around the ones between of course, several of which appear as optional bosses, but you can also find them as mini bosses, situated in certain places in a way I really like, such as in Stormville Castle, in Crumbling Farama's Eula, and in the Siofra Aqueduct. There's also the tree variants who I also think make for brilliant and challenging opponents, but my favourite are the conventional ones with their signature axe helm in tribute to their former leader, Lord Godfrey. Their crucible horn shields which I consider to be the single most awesome looking shields in the game, and their greatswords which are imbued with an ancient holy essence, and tinted a coppery red, the colour of primordial gold. The crucible element really is key to what makes these knights stand out so much for me. You fight plenty of soldiers and knights in Elden Ring, many of which make for fun opponents while others can be something of a headache, but the Crucible Knights stand head and shoulders above the rest in terms of being interesting and mysterious, not only in their appearance but also their fighting style. Of course, their swordplay, shield bashes and foot stomps can be very tough to get to grips with for a new player, especially if they try and take on that early game one in the Storm Hill Ever Jail, but for as challenging as all that is to contend with, it's when they start pulling up the aspects of the Crucible incantations that things get that extra bit interesting, featuring attacks based on wings, the tail and breath. From the very first time I saw a Crucible Knight back on some of the earliest gameplay footage of Elden Ring up until today where I've beaten every one of them several times over, I've been enamoured with them, to the point where I think they make for one of FromSoft's greatest knight enemies, top 3 for sure and maybe even number 1. 
But then on the other end of the mini-boss spectrum, I've got a different kind of enemy in mind. In fact, it's literally the very first enemy you even encounter, way up in the Chapel of Anticipation as a boss fight, though they appear in several other locations too as non-respawning mini-bosses. It's the Grafted Scion. Like several other worst entries on this list, I'll say now, awesome design for an enemy. There's a good reason FromSoft picked this thing as the game's first boss. It's because its design is both striking and disturbing, resembling a grotesque spider of fused flesh, featuring a thick central portion from which mismatched and misshapen limbs sprout, wielding a pair of ornamental straight swords at one side and a large golden beast crest shield at the other. In fact, I go so far as to claim that the grafted scions are one of the best looking monsters in Elden Ring, essentially being an even more inhuman version of Godric the Grafted. However, there's always a however, fighting these things is baffling. Elden Ring is of course no stranger to absurdly difficult enemies and bosses. In fact, it features several of the most challenging enemies of any FromSoft game, but Grafted Scions are one of those creatures that I still don't quite know how to fight. For those who watched my last video, I have very similar feelings about Royal Revenants, but at least they do have a significant weakness in that they take big damage from healing incantations, whereas for Grafted Scions, despite me having over 250 hours clocked into this game, I often prefer to just run the fuck away from them because I don't get what their weakness is, I don't understand when I'm supposed to attack. I think of them in much the same way as I do the Outrider Knights from Dark Souls 3, and that I love their design and concept, but not their mechanics, and at the end of the day, the most important aspect of any Soulsborne enemy is, is it enjoyable to fight? And my answer to that question, insofar as Grafted Scions are concerned, I'm afraid, is a resounding, twirling no. And there you have it folks, there's my list, another one. Bit of a tricky type of enemy to talk about really what, with the different ways mini bosses feature in each game, and I was originally just not going to do this video at all, but then I did do the video, and this is it, you just watched it. Great writing. This is all in the script by the way. As for what's next in the series, I'm thinking about doing best and worst NPCs, which is a topic I haven't covered much at all in my videos, so that should be a lot of fun. Ugh, who am I kidding? Who's even still watching at this point? The percentage of people who watch right till the end of the video is minuscule. I can say literally anything right now, and no one would know. I could just go, me 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 me